Welcome back to the CDO IQ Symposium here in Cambridge, Mass. Packed event here uh, in its 18th year. And this is Paul Gillen for the Cube with Sanjeev Mohan. Sanjeev, a uh, huge, huge crowd down there. Yes, uh, in fact, a little known secret, which I, I'm not even sure if I should say so in public, but the capacity of this hotel is 550, and we have 738 people in a person. <laughs> Don't <laughs> tell the fire department. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, our next guest really needs no introduction. If you've been around data analytics uh, for any period of time, you've encountered Tom Davenport. I won't read you his entire CV, but oh, he's on, a professor, please. he's please. a <laughs> author, author of more than 20 books, uh, columnist, uh, frequent contributor to the Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, uh, a, a renowned consultant in the area of data analytics, and someone who is really a genuine thought leader. Tom, thanks for joining us. Happy to be here, thanks for having me. You are presenting today, as you so often do, because so much of your work is research-based, a new survey relating to CDOs and their role in the organization. Do you want to describe quickly what, what the survey found? Yeah, it was, I actually, this is the second survey that I've done with CDO IQ respondents, um, senior uh, versions thereof, and Last, the first year was about how CDOs can create value um, in their roles, um, one key way by adding analytics to their title. Um, but this latest one um, was um, sponsored by ThoughtWorks, and it is about the structure of um, management in the technology and data field within organizations. and. I, I sort of started this on a hunch and ThoughtWorks was willing to go with it. Um, the hunch was a random comment I heard about a financial services provider here in Boston. Um, the CEO said, another tech chief? We got enough of those already hmm. the, uh, about adding a chief data officer. And so I thought, started thinking maybe there are too many of these. You know, we have proliferated a very large number. We have. CIOs, we have chief digital officers, chief data officers, we have chief technology officers, chief analytics officers, chief information security officers. It's just quite mind boggling. So I wondered if there were too many of these and so we asked senior people who attended CDO IQ, are people confused in your organization? Very confused as it turned out. I mean something like 80% said that people only somewhat at best understand where to go for what. And um, they don't collaborate effectively with each other, these groups in many cases. They said 80 something percent said there's been a lack of collaboration to kind of solve problems that might cut across boundaries. So we identified this new type of leader for which there's no real name. We call them super tech leaders who manage multiple tech and data functions, and there were a surprising number of them. I interviewed about 10 of them and mentioned them in the report. And I've written it up in a Harvard Business Review article. We'll see if it gets accepted there. But I think it's really um, interesting information, and maybe we'll see the, this proliferation of C-level tech executives start to go back in the other direction a little bit. Uh, it's interesting because when this conference, this conference was very early on, the, the, with the CDO title was added about ten years ago. Yeah, that, it that was information was quality only before that. Right, right when it was, yeah. was just emerging. Is this a crisis for CDOs? Uh, I mean, I think there are several um, headwinds that CDOs are facing. Um, one is um, sort of a problem of popularity. Many of them. Um, are now responsible for analytics and supposedly AI, but in the survey we said, who's responsible, who owns generative AI in your company? And it was all over the map. I mean, it's one of those um, bar charts where everything was the same <laughs> length, basically. Even chief AI officers in many cases don't own it. So um, I think if they can't get generative AI, that's kind of a bad sign. It's, I think it's a political battle. It's so so popular, I think CTOs are probably winning that, that battle. Oh, wow. And then, um, you know, the chief data officer without analytics has always been a problematic 
domain because it's really hard to show improvements in data management that people can recognize and see the value of. Those with analytics and, and certainly with AI, I think are on steadier ground, but anecdotally, uh, there are a fair number more CDOs on the job market now than there were before. It used to be they would lose their jobs, but there was such a demand they would immediately be hired by somebody else, but that's not the case anymore. Also, I've noticed that the job descriptions of CDOs across different companies are so different. It's not like a CFO where it's a cut and dry job. It's like, you know, some CDOs are focused on governance, risk, compliance, some are focused on analytics, some are focused on advanced analytics like AI. So it's kind of feels like all over the map. It so is. I mean, in, this, in the study that I did for AWS, on the first study of CDOs, the second one was more about generative AI and CDOs, but in the first one, we asked, what are your responsibilities? And there were like 12 things oh that people wow. named as, you know, nobody can do 12 things Correct. effectively. And certain areas like data governance, that was number one, um, yeah. but I was just in a session and somebody said, raise your hand if your data governance program has been highly successful mm -hmm. and nobody raised their hand. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a behavior change issue and it's really hard to change people's behavior. Right. So data governance has been so sticky uh, because it's so important. It's like existential need to govern your data. But uh, over the years, I've seen people are like, no, don't talk to me about data governance. Let's call it data enablement. Let's call it data That's intelligence. That's what I say. I say call <laughs> it data enablement. Make I it see. easy for people to do the right yeah, thing. Correct. Yeah, correct. Yes, yeah. The, uh, uh, you mentioned uh, we have too many tech leaders, uh, CDOs, when I was first uh, talking to them, we were saying, no, 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 I don't want to be a tech leader. I want to, data is not a tech function. It shouldn't be part of IT. Do you think it's being stereotyped that way? I think it is stereotyped as a tech function, yes. And um, I think the most successful CDOs are clearly business people trying to accomplish business objectives and having very close partnerships with the rest of the business. But um, I think most people in organizations would say, yeah, you know, it's one of those jobs like CIO, CTO, et cetera. Um, and in many cases, they, they do still report to tech-oriented functions, be it chief digital officer, chief information officer, whatever. So do you think more than 50%? Because some years ago in Gartner, we used to run these studies, it was kind of evenly split between business and tech. So what, has that changed over the years? Well, the, the vast majority of people said they are hybrid business and tech people in the, in the survey that I did a couple of years ago. Um, but I think that might be a bit confusing to people outside of, of that function. They don't necessarily know, and data sounds pretty techy. Hmm. I want to switch gears. You have a new book coming out about citizen development. Thank you. Uh, this Operators are standing by. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's not for sale until October, and unfortunately, it is not on pre-sale discount for Amazon Prime Day today. Oh, <laughs> right. And it's Wiley's publishing it, right? Wiley, yeah, because they were fast. My usual academic publishers just too slow to, for such a fast-changing yeah. area. There's been a huge growth trajectory of citizen developers. Where do you see this phenomenon going? Do, uh, will, will citizen developers, particularly as, as they're enabled by AI co-pilots, be limited to mainly workflow and sort of basic uh, automation tasks, or do you see this growing into more of a enterprise class development function? Well, you know, I don't think it's going to replace, you know, your ERP system or uh, your, um, your employee, uh, information system, uh, but I think departmental applications, absolutely. Um, uh, fairly substantial workflows, as you suggested, and then um, I, being an analytics-oriented person, am really interested in the democratization of citizen, of, of data science, and so I think citizen data science has been slower than some of these other areas to take off, but we found some great examples of it starting to really prosper, and as you say, I think AI, generative AI changes everything, because if you can say what you want, be it a, a application or a website or an automation or a, 
um, data science model, you got it. So, Tom, I have two questions. So, first of all, uh, the first question, Jensen Huang has gone on stage many times and said, stop teaching your kids programming languages. What do you Yeah, have that's to in our book. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah. What do you think about that? I agree. I mean, I think that, you know, it it's, could be viewed as something useful in the same way that you still teach kids how to do long division, hmm. um, even though they use calculators for the rest of their lives. But, you know, knowing how it works yeah. is useful. But I think certainly by the time most kids get into the workplace, um, you won't have to do much coding yourself. Okay. Or at a minimum, you're going to do it in conjunction with a, with a co-pilot. Okay, so th so my second question was about co-pilot, but I want to take it a step further. Uh, co-pilot to me indicates there's always a human in the loop, somebody who's initiating the job. But we are also hearing more and more, and more about AI agents that are semi-autonomous, multi-step functioning. I, I know you've talked about AI agents. What are your thoughts on that? Well, in general, I'm a pretty big supporter of keeping us humans around <laughs> <laughs> in some capacity. Um, and certainly with generative AI, I mean, you could have all sorts of content be produced mm. um, without human intervention, but it's likely to be bad, you know, to probably boring and probably ro um, wrong in some cases. So. Um, I think we should try to keep humans in the loop as much as we can. It's hard to do. I mean, um, I wrote a piece for Harvard Business Review last week about you have to, you know, have behavioral guidelines and change for generative AI if you're going to keep the human in the loop because most humans are more than happy to say, sure, go ahead, generate that blog post for me or that product description or whatever. One study, early study out of MIT found 68% of people with a writing task were told, you know, you might want to edit this, but they chose not to. Oh, wow. um, So um, it's going to be hard, I think, yeah. in many cases, to keep a human in the loop, but I think generally it's a good idea. Agents, I think, you know, for things that aren't mission critical could be okay, but we could get into trouble really fast yeah, if we have AI and agents yeah, making all these decisions. Yeah, because there's no human in the loop. Like taking it, actions, yeah. Yeah, because if, if uh, there's some hallucination from an LLM and, and a human consumes that, they can reject it or they can react to it, but if there's no, no human and, and it's gonna kick off a downstream next step. Yeah, yeah, we, exactly. It could be catastrophic. Yeah, and most of the agent talk now is for generative AI, and generative AI, you know, People call it hallucinations, but it's just a, you know an imperfect prediction, and it's Correct. that's not going to change. It's not going to. It's, not gonna it's, gonna prob it's probably uh, it's probabilistic yeah, it's model. Yeah, it's a probabilistic so, yeah. model, yeah. and yeah. Um, unless somebody figures out a way to combine it with something deterministic, and yes. I'm not sure that's true, going to happen. Yeah. Um, I think it's always going to need some oversight. Uh, nevertheless, the age of agentic AI, as it's being called, is on us. I read over the weekend that OpenAI is uh, talking internally about this. Their, their next big breakthrough they're going to announce is, is, is agent-based um, generative AI. How should data leaders be preparing for this next mm, th phase? Well, I think it would be a good idea before it hits in a big way to have some idea of where it would be most valuable and what are the use cases where we could use um, something that wouldn't get us in too much trouble if things went awry. And, you know, we've seen what happens in um, uh, investment banking, for example, when you have agentic trading systems and they've gone haywire. You, you may remember a few years ago we had the flash crash where, I, don't, I remember I, I just, um, gotten some Accenture stock uh, and it went from $44 to two cents in oh, a matter of oh seconds. God, oh Fortunately, it came back, but, <laughs> and nobody ever really understood why that happened because first of all, you know, with most AI, now the models are so incredibly complex, we don't Correct. understand how they work. And if you have multi-agent systems interacting with each other, it sounds to me like we, we need to be really careful with that right. stuff. At least for now. For now. Yeah. Glad Thank it came you. back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. You have to be somewhere. You have to be somewhere. Uh, we could talk forever. Uh, Tom, 
Davenport, you have a, a gift for translating complex concepts into simple language yes. and, and much appreciated. Thank you. And you've pleasure. inspired a lot of us. Thank Glad you. to hear it. Thank you very much. We'll be back from the CDO IQ Forum in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Paul Gillen with Sanjeev Mohan. Stay with us. <laughs>